there has been a matter of great concern in the recent past people who have been taking their lives this is a sad affair suicide has been a big issue and today that's what we are going to talk about this is now tell us and i'm your host anthony moirore at now tell us we have guests come and tell us stories they come and inspire us they come and educate us on a subject and always we are having a great time with our guests and i promise you today's guest is exceptional although we are sharing on a sad story but i just ask you to wait and see stay tuned if you have a question on suicide ask it if you have a comment to make we appreciate feedback so do so and remember to share this with all your friends and without taking much more time because i know we've got quite a lot to cover why don't you join me as we go together and meet our guest today who is known as colin hughes here we go Hi, Colin. Hello, Anthony. How are you today? I'm fine. How about you? Oh, I'm doing good. Wonderful. Good to see you here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, where are you? I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay. Maybe you can tell us what's your height from ground level, uh, taking consideration that you have some uh, <laughs> noise protectors or something <laughs> is it too yeah. loud for you no i no no it's not too loud i'm i'm just wondering how i mean i thought you look like a pilot so i was wondering how <laughs> high you are <laughs> oh, okay. i'm sitting on the ground <laughs> you're sitting on the well, ground well in my chair actually i have a chair okay. <laughs> in my in my sound booth I'm okay. a voice actor, so I ha I've got to have uh, this high dollar equipment that I use. Okay. Now, can we know who is Colin? If you would be kind to introduce yourself in the uh, most uh, appropriate or the most uh, liked way to introduce yourself. Oh boy, who is Colin? Well, who is Colin? I'm I'm somebody that goes after things that that I want to do in life. As a child, I had three dreams: to be a cowboy, uh -huh. be a pilot and to be an actor. Okay. I rode bulls for several years with a big part of that as a member of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association, which is the NFL of professional rodeo. Okay. And was privileged to compete against some of the greatest legends in the sport of professional rodeo. Mm -hmm. After I stopped riding bulls, when I got too old at the age of about you now 33 or 34, it's old for a bull rider. I uh, started to announce rodeos and found out that I love the microphone. Mm. Most, most people, when they think they have to speak publicly, even if it's in a group of 10 people, you know, they freeze up. Me, you put me in a stadium with thousands of people and put me behind a microphone. I'm like, <laughs> we're going to have some fun. Yeah. And um, now retired from the airlines. I've got, I have, I've, uh, was an airline captain, retired from that. Last oh, I, year, I, I guess that now we that's that's how we can guess why you, <laughs> why you have your headgear. <laughs> oh no, these are two big. I, I wear very much smaller ones in in the okay. airlines. Yeah, just okay. ones that go on my ear and a boom mic come around and I like that. But yeah, so mm -hmm. and now I'm working on chapter three, which is I'm a voice actor. Also have a an agent who's talking about getting me in front of the camera as well. So I'm. I am living out my dreams. That's wow. who I am. That's that's beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. it's it's also my dream to uh, be most of what you've talked about, especially 
no, I, I know at some point maybe I could be a captain. I don't know, but uh, it's not one of them. My, uh, a, a speaker speaking to thousands and thousands uh, on a live stage that that would be good, and uh, yeah, uh, that all will be good. It's fun. <laughs> don't we all have dreams, big dreams? Yeah, it's that's my motto is um, do what you love and love what you do. Uh huh. And if you have dreams, you know, if you if you have something that you really enjoy in life, find a way to find a way to monetize it to where you don't have to work. You're doing what you love and yeah. getting paid to do it. <laughs> oh, this goes out to anybody who's listening out there. Whatever it is that you're doing and you love doing it, you can always find a way to make it your livelihood. Absolutely. So says Colin, and he's going to give us ideas and, and maybe, uh, yeah, come back to give us more ideas on that because it's uh, an idea that is uh, people are, many people are looking forward to get uh, some insight from. Okay. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on our topic suicide. And I say that we all have dreams and especially the young ones. Uh, when we were, we, uh, we were young, we used to dream big dreams and uh, we would achieve most of the things that we achieved. But then some of them, um, as we continued to grow older we, and we met with challenges, and then we could go into uh, a lot of, uh, uh, when we meet challenges, we, we, we may fall into depression, we may fall into uh, uh, wrong thoughts, we may think that this is the end of the world. And, uh, comes that time when I think, oh, now I'm tired of this world and, and I think of taking my own life. I know you have a story on that and I'm going not to talk much because I'm, I want <laughs> you to tell us your story, your experience and anything that you would want us to hear concerning this topic. Go ahead. Well, suicide is a topic that I had never really thought about mm -hmm. much of. You know, I had a friend way back in the late 1970s who ended his own life and that's as close as i've, I've ever been to a suicide you know of knowing somebody who had sui suicidal thoughts and mm -hmm. he was actually the first person that you know wasn't a family member but a friend that, that the first time i ever cried over the death of a friend mm -hmm. uh Kay kirby you know wrote rodeo uh rodeo buddy of mine Road Bulls, national, national Finals, bareback bronc rider, just a great guy. But since then, you know, I never gave suicide much of a thought until January 10th, 2022. My daughter calls me. At least that's what it said on the caller ID. When she answered, when I answered, I said, hey, honey, how you doing? And it was not her. It was her husband. Mm-hmm. And I knew something, I knew there had to be something going on, but I didn't think it was going to be what it was. And that was that my 15 year old granddaughter had ended her own life. Hmm. And this is a child that you know, brought me so much joy in life and Kind of helped me to feel young. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's my wife and I had taken her to Hawaii when she was 12 years old for vacation. And her and her brother came out one year for my birthday. And we uh, were going to take them down to Universal Studios, but I wound up being sick. So it was my friend, my wife, and one of her friends that, that took the children. Mm -hmm. But just, you know, these times in our home and when I was flying, she was living up in the Northeast. And so, you know, if I had an extended time off, you know, anything more or like four, maybe five days off or whatever, I'd, instead of going right home to Vegas, I'd catch flight up to Boston to where I could go spend a day or so with them and then go home and see my wife. Mm -hmm. And so I've ha had a lot of opportunity to spend, spend time with her in this She meant the world to me. 
And, you know, I told you that I love the microphone. Well, yeah. throughout my life, when I discovered my gift of gab, we'll call it, mm -hmm. I just wondered, I just thought that there has to be a greater a greater calling for this talent than announcing rodeos or doing stand-up comedy like I have, have done some of. And it had to be something greater because there's a few times in my life that I know I was literally saved from, from death. Mm -hmm. As a child, I was drowning in a lake, caught in a whirlpool, could not kick out. And... Just as I thought, you know, I was going to go, be going under and not be able to breathe at, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, a man reaches in and grabs him by the arm and pulls me out. Mm -hmm. And we were, family was at a picnic area there. And I ran over to told my, tell my mother about it. it. says, oh, there's nothing like that in Lake Manawa. You're exaggerating. Mm -hmm. So I had to prove her right. So I ran next to the camp to the picnic area next to us where this man walked back to and described him and nobody knew who he was. Mm. And then as a young man, I was probably about 20 or so. I was getting ready to walk across a road and I was standing in front of a truck traveling with, uh, caught a ride with the stock contractor. They're hauling the livestock to a rodeo. And I, I was getting ready to step out in front of the truck onto a road to cross the road to go to the convenience store. And somebody yelled my name out and said, get back. And just as I stepped back and look a little bit, a car going about 60, 70 miles an hour, I could feel the, the wind coming off of the car. Mm -hmm. That's how close it was. And there's a couple other times, not that close, but, but close that, and I've always wondered what have I been saved for? There's got to be something deeper than, so throughout a big portion of my adult li life, I thought, you know, I, I want to, I want to do some motivational speaking. And I thought of different topic after topic after topic, and I could never find something that I could be passionate about. Mm -hmm. When I got the call that morning on June 10th last year, I was I was wailing and screaming and yelling and crying harder than I ever had in my entire life. But through all that pain, through all that pain, right in the middle of it, right just a few seconds after I had learned about the death of my grandchild, the thought came to my head, says, this is what you've been saved for. Mm. And so I have a, little way of saying it that, you know, I've searched for something that I could speak about passionately for many years. I have still not found it, but unfortunately it found me. Hmm. So this topic thrust itself upon me and hmm. I, it's in the research I've been doing. It just, it's, the numbers are astounding of people who end their own life. Worldwide, 800,000 people. Worldwide. Yeah, and many of the stories, we never get to hear them unless we there's someone who is significant, someone they mention his name, just like a few months ago when we had this uh, television icon that took his life and everybody was like, whoa, I can't believe that really happened. I, right. we, thought, we thought that he has always been happy. We thought that he's achieved the height of his success. And what what could have trans, transpired with him? It's, you can't tell. Some of the research I've been doing, I took a online course with the uh, QPR Institute. QPR stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. And they've got it. They call it the gatekeeper program where it's $30. Mm -hmm. You can go on and take this course that teaches you how to know some of the signs of suicide and also mm -hmm. how to ask somebody. It says, you know, you, it, there's different ways. One of the myths about suicide is that if you mention it, 
people think, oh, if, if you talk to somebody about it, they're just going to want to do it more. That's entirely false. If mm-hmm. you come right out and say, are you thinking about ending your own life? Or have you ever thought that you just didn't want to wake up in the morning? Questions like that. You, But then you, you don't want to do it like this. You know, if a, if a teenager's talking to a friend of his and mentions it, the guy says, oh, yeah, man, yeah, I thought about that one time. Man. I don't know. Yeah, it's tough out there, yeah. I can see why you do it. <laughs> That's not how you do it. Mm-hmm. You don't say, so are you thinking about, are you, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Mm-hmm. You're not thinking, it's just because then they say, oh, uh, uh, no, no, no. It's, are you considering ending your life? Do you ever think that you don't want to wake up in the morning? You, know, you question them and People will open up. And the big thing then is to listen. Listen and let them know that they're heard. Let them know that they're loved. Be there for them. They they just need somebody to be there for them that they can talk to. And in this conversation, then comes the persuade. Persuade them to get help. And then refer. Find somebody that they can go to for help. And the best way to do it is, you know, if you're sitting right there with them, so, well, let me call, let me call this guy or this, this person. Yeah. Hey, and then you take them, you take them to get the help. Mm. It's, there's one thing that everybody who's ever considered suicide has in common. And that's, they feel that there is no hope mm. for whatever for whatever reason, not just no hope in life, but you can be backed into a corner. You know, a, a high school student who uh, got their first F and think their parents are going to be so upset with them. They feel that there's no hope for them to get beyond that F. Mm-hmm. And that consumes them to the point of, well, I only have one option. I can't live with this. Hmm. And it can be really that simple sometimes. Mm. And so, you know, for parents, instead of, you know, lecturing them about the F, you, you talk to them as a loving parent. Mm-hmm. It's like, you got an F? No. So, you know what? Life is full of failures. You know, Michael Jordan, one of, you know, one of the greatest bas- basketball players ever. He said that his success was based on failures. Mm -hmm. You have to fail to succeed. Mm. Says he's had 9,000 missed free throws. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that, that's how you learn. It's, you know, with younger people today, a lot of them have never been told, you know, to do this, you're going to have to work for it and you will have failures along the way. Yeah. Don't let them hold you back. Mm-hmm. Pick yourself up, scrape off the dust, and go do it again and learn from that mistake. Mm. Whether it's an F or a failed relationship or whatever it may be. Some mm. people just don't think that there's hope. But you know what? Life is. There, even in all the turmoil in life today, love and hope still exist. They truly do. Love and hope still exist, says Colin. <laughs> and QPR, thank you very much for QPR. And stepping a bit back and going to the story of your granddaughter, what could have prompted her to take her own life. Did did were there some things going on in her life in the family? Well, she, um, in 2017, her father was killed in an automobile accident. Oh. And her little brother was in the car with their father. Hmm. And he was in the hospitalized for three months. He was cut so 
so badly in the front that his internal organs were exposed. Wow. Yeah, and uh, several broken bones. And then in, now uh, I can't remember the exact time, but last year that not too far before my granddaughter entered her life, my mother, my granddaughter's great, great grandma mm. had passed away at the age of 96 Whoa. or 95 mm-hmm. and 95. Yeah. And that was, she looked like she was 200 cause she smoked her entire life. I don't know how she lived that long. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh-huh. And my, my little granddaughter thought a lot of, of her, of her great grandma. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if that played in or not, but I do know that she was on antidepressants. My daughter told me that she found all of her medications that she said she was taking, but she was not taking them. Okay. And it's, you know, if people are on antidepressants, it is so important, so important to stay on those. Don't take yourself off all by yourself. That, that, is dangerous Mm -hmm. that could absolutely be dangerous because you know you're you're talking about medications that alter things in in your mind Mm -hmm. and to come off them cold turkey without without medical supervision is not wise no, if you think you're, you know, if you think you're better, sure, talk to your doctor and start weeding them off. <laughs> mm. But not cold turkey, so that may have had something to do with it. I don't know. Were well, there some indications at some point coming from from her, as your granddaughter may have reported that at some point she may have she may have re- threatened to take her own life or something like that. No, never. No. Uh-huh. Totally out of left field. It's uh she was always every every picture I have of her, well almost every picture I have of her, you know, with, with me or with my wife and I, she's always got this smile on her face. She just so happy, so go, you know, just so loved life. She ran mm-hmm. track. She in the state of state of Nebraska where they lived when when she died, she became a part of the first ever all-girl wrestling team in the state of Nebraska. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so she wrestled and she loved that and running and she just she did things and she enjoyed them. You know, I and I still listen to some of her voicemails that she left me and always so happy go lucky. Hmm. So at some time, some of the people that we could be seeing with big smiles could be hiding something beneath. Yes. Without absolutely. Knowledge. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It, some of the things to look for is one big thing, if somebody, you know, starts self-medicating heavily, you know, drinking a lot or, you know, whatever type of mind maltering, you know, you know, illicit drugs, if they start using suddenly, mm-hmm. that is a big, big, big red flag right there. Or if they go from being this normally happy person to all of a sudden just bottomed out, no more joy in their eyes, no more laughter. That's a big sign too. And we, uh, and then sometimes if somebody who's going to end their life has made the decision to do so and they've planned it out and they're getting ready to do it, it feels like there's a burden lifted from them and they're, they're happy Mm -hmm. in that last, in that, those, that last day. Hmm. I, I wonder if what I found out afterwards, if it was a sign, my, my daughter, absolutely. My granddaughter loved, loved, loved the water. 
Mm-hmm. That girl was like a fish. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we took her to swim with the dolphins when we took her to Hawaii and always in the pool at night. When we got, when we got back to the hotel at the, at, we got back to the hotel at the end of a day. And when I'd go to visit them, she'd always want to go somewhere she could swim and she just loved it. And she was working at their hometown swimming pool, small town in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And she was working there. So I kind of wanted to, you know, feel that last day of her life. When my wife and I went back to the funeral, I went out to the swimming pool just, just to imagine her in that water. The manager came up and asked if he could help me. The swimming pool was closed at the time, and I told him who I was and why I was there. He opened up the gate, let me in, and he took me to the snack room, the snack stand where my granddaughter worked, Mm -hmm. and said that she was working on becoming the supervisor in the snack stand, and also that her last day on earth her last day was at, at work was that same day. And he said that was the best day that she had ever had there. Mm. So it just makes me wonder if, you know, she felt that burden, if she'd made that decision then and felt that burden was lifted and, and just had it all planned and ready to go. Oh, mm. it's, Now, she took her life and you buried her. And today we can see you afford a a, a laugh. And (laughs) with that, took a while. It took a while. while. How did you overcome it that you can afford such a a heavy laugh today? As even you are committed and you are passionate about uh, talking about uh, that and helping other people. I, I still feel guilty sometimes. Mm. But then I just remember, you know, that the way she was. And that, and I just got to remember that loving, wonderful child that she was. And I can't walk around in a depressive mood all the time the rest of my life. That's, you know, that's not healthy, but. The first time that I laughed afterwards, I felt so guilty. Mm. And I still do a little bit. It's in 2015, I lost my oldest daughter to cancer. Oh, sorry for that. And, you know, a lot of people say that losing a child is the most difficult thing a a parent could go through. Mm Mm-hmm. Losing my granddaughter to suicide was far worse, much worse. Mm. But when when my daughter got the word that she only had three to six months left to live, I called a friend of mine who lost his son in an automobile accident. And I says, man, Johnny, how do you get through this? He says, that's just it. You get through it, but you'll never get over it. Hmm. And that's the thing. You just, you just push through it. You, you find ways to deal and to cope. And that's one of the things that, you know, coping, everybody has their own coping mechanisms, but you got to find positive coping mechanisms to get through things like this. And it, it's going to be different for everybody. But one thing, especially, you know, when you're that, that close to somebody, don't be afraid to get help from a professional. Don't be afraid to admit that you have problems with, with, mental, with mental health. Is it, are you always going to, you know, we talk about 
mental illness and people think, you know, immediately think, oh, they're crazy. Mm. No, no. That it, it seems like such a taboo subject to so many people. And it's really not. Here's, here's a good example is that uh, pilots before 2010, pilots could not use antidepressants, period. Mm. That was it. Mm-hmm. I grounded myself in 2008 to go on antidepressants. I was flying charter at the time. Okay. And so I just not, I didn't have to tell the FAA because I wasn't going to go back and renew my FAA medical certificate. I just left it alone. In 2010, the FAA made, made the announcement they were going to allow four different types of antidepressants, mm-hmm. but to get, on it to, you know, testing and testing and testing and on and on and on. And during that time I had started a blog, Prozac pilot. Hmm. I actually put a, my uniform shirt on a bag over my head, cut holes out for the eyes. And I made a video says, I am the Prozac pilot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So when the news of antidepressants with the FAA came out, I had media from all over the world reaching out to me and I've been on, you know, a few different shows talking about mental health and pilots and Mm -hmm. it's still this is how taboo it is still in flying today even though there's four different types of antidepressants Mm -hmm. if a pilot gets help from a therapist even the pilot has to report it when they do their faa medical Mm -hmm. each time they renew their faa medical has to report that professional that they've seen Mm-hmm. And people are so afraid to do that. This lady that I've met since losing my granddaughter, her son was a, you know, up and coming pilot. He had his private pilot license working on his other ratings to where he could, where he could be an, an airline pilot. Mm-hmm. And then one day he just said he was done with life more or less. And had a cross country planned all by himself in in a in a small airplane. Before he left, he texted people and to tell them goodbye. And then he took off and he flew the plane into the ground. Hmm. His one of his roommates was you know all of them were you know devastated, but one of them was took it a took it extremely hard and on the phone told his father who was an airline captain told his father that he wanted to see a therapist to get help get through this and his dad says don't do that no don't you do that you'll ruin your career Hmm. and it's so it doesn't in in when I talk to young pilots, you know, if they're, if they're suffering through something like that, one thing I, I tell them is, is, man, being a pilot is not what you are. It's just something that you do. Mm-hmm. You fly airplanes and pilots so much identify themselves as pilots and nothing else. Not mm-hmm. as a father, not as a son, not as a brother, not as a sister, not as this or this or this or a child of God that's just, I'm a pilot. When I was riding bulls, yeah, I'm a bull rider. That's who, that's what I am. Mm. I'm a pilot. That's what I am. No, that's just something that you do. You're a person mm-hmm. first and foremost. And with, with people that love you and people that you love. And that's, that's the, the inner soul. That's, that's who you truly are. Mm-hmm. And, making this the the decision not to get help when you truly need it can actually be a life or death decision i mean if you if one of these young people never fly again at least they'll be alive there's mm. always something else that you can do in life and it's good to hear that from you and because life changes, things do change from day to day. There are some people who 
did so during the pandemic. They thought that things will never change. They, they thought that that is the end of life because uh, some may have lost their job, some may have loved their, uh, lost their loved ones and then they gave up on life. But then if we take your word today to remember that life changes and there can be something else that you can do, not that job that you lost, not the job that you're fearing you might lose by finding some help. Well, actually, here's here's something that a lot of people think. That during mm. at 2020, when the pandemic hit and lockdowns went around the world, mm. a lot of people think suicide went up. It did not. It actually declined. Mm-hmm. For the United States, the average death toll for suicide each year is about 29,000. Wow. And 2020, it was 24,000. Mm-hmm. How's that? I don't know. That's all. I, that's just the data that I got from the CDC, and that's well, they. They had so many other things to think about. I guess so. It's oh. it's, okay. yeah. It's that's surprising that I thought so as well. Oh, look at them. They're all depressed, and so no, it it declined. Oh, it really did, but uh, that's so messy. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, we've heard uh, your story and uh, it's a sad thing that, I mean, all the stories that you've told and you've quite an experience on this on suicide. Uh, I can't remember so many people that I've, I have, may have one or two that I have had uh, of. But then uh, thank you for sharing that because um, we can always be on the lookout for any possible uh, negative yeah activity from someone and also we can always remember you uh, using the ideas the inspiration that you've given us that life does not end with your failure today in whatever circumstance, exactly whatever area of life you are talking about but there is a tomorrow where you can rise up again what what i like to tell especially younger people is you know if if, if, if you're in a situation to where you feel you're hopeless where you feel you cannot talk to your parents you cannot talk to your friends whatever you feel that you're not loved and you feel that there's no hope in the world i'm telling you love and hope do exist if you cannot find it at home go down the street talk, you know talk to somebody else not not one of your friends is going to say hell yeah man i thought about that too no no, that's not what you want to do. Go down the street, go to a church, go to a synagogue, go to a mosque, go to a youth center, find somebody, find somebody who can show you how to cope, teach you how to cope and teach you that love still exists. Teach you that hope is out there. All you have to do, even when there's pain in all that pain, there's still hope in the world, no matter what. Wow, they've had that. And thank you for sharing. Thank you. For anybody who's listening there, you've got the message. And if you even get to hear this or watch this after we are through, uh, you've had the message. And we thank you for taking your time to watch it up to this point. Now, apart from uh, speaking on and looking forward to speak on bigger stages around the world, uh, what other thing do you have going on? Like, do you work with people one on one or anything? Any? Well, uh, I'm I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health professional. You yeah. know, if I knew somebody was going through this, I you mm -hmm. know I would use the the QPR program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to talk to them to get them to go to somebody. That uh, one thing I've recently become involved with though is the Malinoy Foundation. Okay. My wife and I. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, the death of my grandchild put, hit me extremely hard. My wife had talked about, you know, we always talked about getting her dog. She says, well, mm -hmm. that could be good therapy. So I looked up emotional um, support animals. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that there's a difference between an emotional support animal and a psychiatric service dog. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody can take their pet and go online and pay, you know, what, $125, whatever it is, and get their animal any their pet registered as an emotional support animal that does not give you the right to take that 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 animal on an airline flight or yeah. into a restaurant you can be turned away plain and simple mm -hmm. 
A psychiatric service dog, on the other hand, is trained specifically to do something. Like, say, a return veteran who has, you know, very severe PTSD, has night terrors, you know, where he gets up. And he, they can actually be dangerous in this point. The dog mm. will be trained to wake him up or her up. Ah. Can remind you to take medications. In some cases with a special device, they can even call 911. Wow. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Like yeah. uh, with, I'm diabetic. I could my dog. Uh, the Malinois Foundation is is getting. They train these animals and they donate them, and they are actually getting giving me a uh, a service dog. Mm. And what they do, it's like the the miracle of these animals of how many. I don't know. There's thousands of people, or I don't know. I wish I knew the numbers, but thousands of people that have psychiatric service dogs, and of all these people. 82% of them report a reduction in suicidal thoughts. Wow. One third of them after 18 months, one third of them no longer meet, no longer meet any of the criteria of having PTSD. Oh, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And 92% of them report a reduction in medications. Hmm. And you know, if anybody, if anybody like to donate to the cause, the Malinois Foundation, and that's M-A-L-I-N-O-I-S, MalinoisFoundation.org. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing that these people do. They, they, you know, they, they don't charge anybody for these animals. It's all done by donations. It's completely free to the people who get these dogs. They do it for veterans, for mm -hmm. First responders who have PTSD because of things they've seen, uh, women survivors, and children with special needs. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing what these what these wonderful animals can do. I guess they're that's saving the lives. The they Malinois are saving Malinois. lives. Ah, the Malinois Foundation dot dot org. I guess that's the the. Website. Yes, M A L I N O I S. Yes. Okay, that's this. So you can all go there and learn more about these canine friends that can save your life. Yes, they are amazing. What else would you like to share before we go off? We well, one last thing on the Malinois Foundation. If you know somebody or you were in need of a service animal, you can apply right on their website to see if you qualify. And this is only in the U.S., so do they... Are they, they uh, I don't know if they can... I'll have to find out about that if, you know, if they do... It's, it is a U.S. United States organization based in Salt Lake City area, and they have several training facilities all across the United States. Okay. And they have... They actually sell franchises to the... Uh, uh, Elite Dog Training Company is the company mm -hmm. that they own that does all the training. So I don't see if they have any, I don't know if they have any overseas or not, but okay. if so. <laughs> yeah. Now, if people would also want to reach out to you, how would you advise them to? I've got a website that um, I made specifically for this. It was... I, you know, I looked for stopsuicide.com, dot org, dot this, dot that, and couldn't find anything. Yep, and there it is. That's one of them. Stop teen suicide. And this just drop down box came down, and there it was life. Stop mm. teen suicide dot life. And also stop suicide dot life. And, um, an email address I have attached to that is grandpa at stop suicide dot life. <laughs> stop suicide dot life. Okay, that's, that's good. So that's a teen suicide, and also there is a stop suicide dot life. Yeah, it's stop teen suicide dot life or stop suicide dot life. And they're one and the same thing. Yes, it's it's the same site. Okay same website okay uh, thank you for sharing this uh, so uh, we appreciate you sharing because uh, we know there is someone out there who's got some uh, some 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 knowledge about uh, this topic and 
some ideas on how to stop it and an idea of how to help someone who's going through it. Quite a lot that you've shared today. We thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, and now we are coming to the end of this show. But before we sign off, we'd like Colin to leave us with a few words that you sh we should always remember. I know he might have shared them already, but it's good to hear them as we are signing off. A few words that we should always remember. Don't give up on life. Life is full of joy, full of love, full of hope. Sometimes you, you don't believe it, but I'm telling you, it's there. I'm, I turn 66 years old the day after tomorrow. And some people say, well, that's old. What's he got to live for? I'll tell you, if I get to be 150 years old and I find out my time is coming, I'm, they'll have to pull me away from life kicking and screaming because I'm saying, I got so much more to do yet. <laughs> happy birthday, Colin. Happy birthday. We wish you Thank happy you. birthday. Once and uh, wonderful 66th year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming to the show. And that's about it. This has been Now Tell Us, and I've been your host, Anthony Murore. And together with our guest today, Colin Hughes, we are signing off. There is life, there is hope in life. Just don't give up on life, keep on living. Exactly. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Ha, 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 ha.